My name is uh, Jay Kumar Radhakrishnan. Uh, speaker this afternoon is Professor Robert Krautgamer from the Weizmann Institute of Science. Uh, Professor Krautgamer got his PhD from the Weizmann Institute in 2001. Then he worked for IBM Alberton uh, until 2007, returning to join the Faculty of Mathematics and Computer Science at the Weizmann Institute and in the Department of Computer Science and Applied Mathematics, which he now heads. Uh, <laughs> Professor Krautgamer is uh, the editor of, uh, editor-in-chief of the SAM Journal on Computing. Uh, his interests are diverse. Uh, um, he's a ex leading expert in algorithms uh, with focus on large data sets, uh, analysis of uh, randomized heuristics, or average case analysis of heuristics. And uh, on behalf of the program committee, I thank uh, Professor Krautkamer for accepting our invitation. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, it's uh, really an honor and pleasure to be here uh, in this wonderful conference. Um, uh, really working on, on a few things. I try to focus on something in, in this talk. I think it's still going to be a bit broad, but uh, I think there's an interesting theme here. So the theme is going to be about uh, sketching graphs and combinatorial approximation. So let's start from sketching, the word sketching. So uh, I'm going to use it for basically data summarization. All right, so you have like a lot of data. You want to somehow get like a smaller image, somehow summarize the data in a useful way, depending on what you want to use it for. So uh, this concept, like in this generality, of course, appears in many, many applications. Uh, and, and the reason I'm interested in, in this is uh, basically it's like a fascinating interplay between the, the uh, combinatorial optimization problems you want to solve, uh, which is going to be the focus of today, and sort of like information theory, but not really in the proper information theory definition, but kind of like how much information about the object you need. Okay, so I don't know if that's the right term, information theory here. Uh, and there are many exciting results. I'm going to tell you about uh, some of them here. Um, and there are many open problems. I try to focus in my talk on this because I know, you know, uh, everybody wants to hear about great results and they want to hear about problems to work on. So I try to em emphasize whenever there are and you'll see them here. Okay, so uh, right into the subject, uh, suppose we have an input graph G and what is the usually we want to do in a computational optimization problem? We have a query, we have some question kind of Q. And we're basically trying to find an optimal solution for this Q. So optimal solution basically means that among all feasible solutions, find the best one. So best is usually to minimize or maximize some objective. Right? And I'm going to look at the context where uh, the input is a graph with n vertices. Okay? Throughout the talk, we have a graph with n vertices somehow in the background. Now here's like, uh, here are two examples. Maybe start with number two. It's basically the minimum shortest path distance between two given vertices S and T. Right, so you have many paths, you want to optimize, find the shortest one. Example number one is basically minimum ST cut, is you, want, you have all cuts between S and T, you want to find the one of minimum capacity. Right, this is computer optimization, Q here is a pair S and T, and maybe for the same graph, I have many repeated questions, how about this ST pair, how about another ST pair for the same graph, right? And basically, if I want to do some sort of like summarization of the data, so then I want to get this huge graph and somehow sketch it into a small object, somehow a smaller representation of the graph, so that then when I get the query, I can actually compute this optimal solution for cut or distance just from the sketch. I don't need the entire graph. Okay, so given the query, I compute or maybe estimate. It's going to be particularly interesting if you can approximate it because then you can often use a smaller sketch but it's more difficult technically, and that's why it's more interesting for many of the people in this room uh, to actually design a less trivial, more sophisticated algorithm that can actually estimate the optimum. Okay, so first you compute from the graph this SK of G, the sketch of G, and then use an estimator algorithm, as you can see there on the right, estimator of the sketch. So you sketch the graph once, but then you get many queries. Of course, we're gonna look at one query, but potentially you could get many queries. Now, uh, in this context, of course, distance problems are very uh, common, well studied. For example, you can use as a sketch a spanner subgraph. You can use a distance oracle. 
but I'm going to focus in this talk on cut problems. Okay, so distances are a perfectly good example. I try to somehow restrict my attention for today on cut problems. Okay, so it's basically uh, example number one and variants of it. Okay, so let's start with this example number one, minimum ST cut. That's like the most basic problem. Everybody studies it in uh, undergrad, in computer science at least. Uh, but here's like another very, very famous problem. So another, I mean, compared to minimum cut, Ford Falkerson, min cut max flow. So this is a little bit later from 61 by Gomorrah and Hu. Uh, seminal result. Now I think people don't teach it as often, but uh, it's really elegant. And that says that if you have a graph G, and you look at the minimum ST cut for all possible pairs of vertices, S and T, in the same graph, but all possible pairs of vertices. So the graph is undirected, could have capacities, I didn't try it, it could have edge capacities, but it's undirected. So you have a, and choose two basically different questions. Compute the minimum ST cut for every possible combination of S and T. Right? So you can actually summarize all these cuts, these and choose two cuts, by a tree. So you can replace the graph G, with a 3T. This tree is going to have exactly the same vertices, same vertex set as V, so, but going to have the same cuts. That's always possible. OK, so here's like a very, very simple example. So you see the requirement there, the mean cut in the, in the, in the tree T is going to be equal to the mean cut in the graph G for every pair of vertices. And here is like a very simple example. What to illustrate this? Suppose you have an N click in, as your graph G. What kind of tree could you, could you use? So for example, I could use a star. So the star has to be the same vertex set. So it has n minus 1 leaves, and one of the vertices is going to be the center. I'm going to give every edge a capacity of n minus 1. So I'm assuming in the click it was unit weight. So now I take any two vertices s and t in the, in the, in the click. What is the minimum cut between s and t? Well, for example, you can separate s from all the other vertices. So basically the degree of s is your cut value. It's n minus 1. Now let's look at the same example in the tree. If S and T are leaves, you can just cut the edge going from S to the uh, center of the star, capacity N minus 1. And if T is the center, then same thing. Okay, so the cuts are, have equal value, N minus 1. This is somewhat so, uh, this is very surprising. Why? Because really the tree has only N edges, N minus 1 edges, so it's very small to store. Actually, the, if you try to compute all the ST cuts in the tree, you immediately see that the value that you're going to get is always going to be one edge. So there are only n minus 1 different values that you can get from the tree. Even though you ask n squared questions about the same graph, it's the same tree, the number of different distinct answers is no more than n minus 1, which implies that it's going to be also the same in the graph G. This is true, follows from this theorem of Gomori and Hu. It's not obvious at all. Um, but it shows redundancy. So instead of a graph of size maybe n squared edges, you get a graph with a tree with n, only order n edges, or the order n words if you want to store it. You can compute things very quickly on the tree. On the tree. So it's very useful. But at the end of the day, what I'm going to say is that this is, for me, like a good sketch. It's a good summary of the data using only order n words, and it gives you the exact value on the top. There's the exact equality. I want to go to approximation, but this is, you know, you get. It, it cannot be better than this, exact, getting exactly the values. And it's deterministic. Like we, we can also look at uh, randomized algorithms in, in, like, uh, few, uh, in a few minutes. Um, this is a wonderful result. And then uh, let me tell you a few words about the algorithm, really, because it's such a key result and uh, uh, you know, not, not taught as often these days. So it's not the full details, just like the high-level argument. So the algorithm has basically n minus 1 iterations. You start with the graph G, you have n minus 1 iterations. At every iteration, you do two things. One of the things, you compute a minimum cut in the graph. So it's going to be either in G or in a graph derived from G, so I'm not going to go into this, these details. But you do one minimum cut execution. And then you, you, what you get from this minimum cut execution is basically a partition of the vertices and the value of the cut. So you use that to somehow recover one edge of the tree, like in, build one edge of the tree T. If you have n minus 1 iterations, you get n minus 1 edges of the tree, and you'll be done. So here is like by picture, you start with the vertex set, V. You compute some minimum uh, cut there. So it partitions the vertices into V1, V2. You get this blob. You put like an edge between these two sets. There's like a meta picture. 
And the capacity of that edge is going to be exactly the capacity that you found in the minimum ST cut. Then you keep doing that. So basically, you say you take, do the same thing in every iteration, say for V1 and then later for V2 or something. So let's start with V2. You partition it using one minimum cut execution. You get information on how to partition V2. You partition V2 into two sets. The value that you get from this min cut calculation, you put on this new edge between what I call their V21 and V22. But you also have to do something else, which is this edge that you had before. You have to somehow extend it. You have to decide whether it connects to the blob V21 or to the V22. Okay, so you have to make these decisions. I'm not telling you all the details. But it's kind of like you keep the same edge, but you have to further direct it in a finer way. Okay, so you keep doing that. N minus one iterations, eventually you get N minus one edges exactly on the vertex set, you get three. Beautiful argument. But there's a lot of big open questions here. One open question, can you do it faster? So how much time does it take? This takes computing a minimum cut every time, and you repeat N minus one iterations, and the rest of the operations are cheaper. So nowadays, we don't even know how to compute minimum cut in linear time. We do not know that. We don't know that, well, we do not even suspect that it's not possible. So let's say it seems plausible that we could do it in linear time. Linear time means order of what we call V plus E, right? Vertices plus edges. So let's say it's order and usually it's connected. So it's like order E or M if you want. And you have to repeat it N times. So it's like, it's like what, much more expensive than uh, linear time, okay? Which is uh, potentially possible. Uh, okay, so how could you attack this problem of finding better algorithms? Better, I mean, faster algorithms. So maybe you can avoid computing minimum cut. Okay, this algorithm works by doing mi minimum ST cut every time. Maybe you can compute all of them at once. Okay, not by but not using just like as a black box, a call to minimum cut. Okay, that's one option. These are open problems, right? I don't know how to solve them. Um, here's another thing that seems so obvious. Okay, we don't know how to do minimum cut in linear time, but we can approximate one plus epsilon approximate minimum cut fast in linear time. For this, there are good algorithms. So why don't you use them? So you get one plus epsilon approximation in every iteration. You have n minus one iterations. Each one is linear time. So now, you, you know, you at least remove that roadblock. Well, it doesn't work. Why? This, the analysis, which I didn't show you, really re relies on the fact that these cuts are, uh, it's like cut is a modular function. And there's something that you do there that really depends on the fact that all the cuts in every iteration you compute an optimal min cut. If you're using a one plus epsilon approximation, then the proof completely breaks down. It's not like the one plus epsilon carries over. Okay, so you'd like to do something fast, like a one plus epsilon approximation. Okay, we don't know how to do it very fast exactly. Maybe we can do it with one plus epsilon approximation. We don't know how to do that. Like, do that, I mean, do a little bit faster uh, using this approximation. Uh, another thing we could try is to solve the problem, like we have really, really fast algorithms, but only a subset of the inputs, like only for planar graphs or, uh, well, for planar graphs, actually, we know. For planar graphs, there is a result, so I did mention it in the open, so it's not going to be confusing. But for, uh, if you just, all the edges are, are unit weight, maybe it's easier. And there are some results that do faster than the general case, but not not uh, linear time, or Urbano tree width, et cetera. Okay, so this is what I wanted to say about Gomery Hoop problem, or algorithm, sorry. Um, let's try to move to other concepts. For example, what I suggest here, like there's the next concept to look at. Can we do more cuts, like analyze or preserve, if you do this, this sketching, I want the sketch to handle more cuts, not just the ST minimum cuts. So the ST minimum cuts are only N squared of them, choices for S and T. The total number of cuts is something like two to the N, right? All partitions of the vertices S, S complement. So there's a lot more to do. Can you do somehow represent all the cuts, two to the N many cuts, using one tree? Is that possible? That sounds fascinating, right? That must be not true. And the answer is, that, well, it's not true if you want to get these exact values. But it's true to some extent, if you, it depends on the approximation that you allow. Okay, so this is actually possible with something that we, uh, uh, people call Reke's tree because he came up with this concept. And it's like the first paper, he Reke O2. Uh, and there's some follow up works that improve the, the quantity. So now what's known is basically you can take a graph 
uh, arbitrary graph, you can build a tree. Now, the tree is not going to have the exact same vertices. So it's going to be bigger. It's not going to have n vertices. It's going to have something like two n vertices. Why? The leaves of the tree is going to be your, vertex, your original vertices. But it's going to have extra in internal vertices. Okay? But, uh, and therefore, you see the number of vertices is going to be at most two n. So it's a slight increase in the size of the object in terms of vertices. But it's a tree. So it's a very small in terms of like, storing the entire tree. And what you know is that for, if you compute the minimum cut in the tree T and you compare it to what you had in the graph G, it's something, it's a num always you get the number between 1 and approximately log n, slightly more than log n. Okay, so it, this 3t approximates every cut in the graph within a factor of O tilde, something like log n, slightly bigger than log n. Simultaneously for all the cuts, all 2 to the n cuts. So for delta G, that's as far as just subtract as well. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> excellent question, right? Uh, so I have a slide for that. Or, so in G, when you look at the minimum, you try to compute minimum cut between S and S bar, it's just the capacity of this cut. But in T, because you have extra vertices, in T you have extra vertices. So basically you have to optimize. Say, I want to separate this set S from S bar. Think of like S being a super source, as we all studied, and S bar being a super sink. And the other vertices, you have to like, uh, decide which side to put them on, the, which side of the cut to place them. It's an optimization problem. But it's not very difficult because it's a tree. Okay, and it, the size is only two n vertices, so it's easy. The parts that result from these need not be connected because uh, every partition is not. Right, right. Need not be, but, but, but the size of the cut is a good approximation. Yeah. Okay, so here still, I mean, okay, the representation is using a tree. It has more vertices. It, Tree has, as I said, uh, this advantage of supporting fast queries. It's very easy to process, store, manipulate, doing queries in log n time or log log n time, order one, all these tricks. And this gives you some sketch of size, basically order n, linear in, in the number of vertices. Uh, now, this argument here, the, the construction here is actually non-constructive. It requires solving an NP-hard problem, basically. So if you want to actually implement it in, say, polynomial time, then you have to pay an extra square root log n factor. Okay, according to the results that we know, which is like the last one in the citations, the Reke and Shah, you get an, uh, have to pay an extra root log n. Um, and another thing is that it extends to multi-commodity flow. So this is something that is kind of like around many of the results throughout the talk today. I tried not to talk about this multi-commodity flow because it requires more time to define this and explain, and it's a more complicated object than cuts. So I'll mention it along the way, whether it extends or does not extend, but I'm not going to go into these details. OK. So we can do that with a log n, approximately log n, uh, about log n approximation. Actually, by the way, this is, uh, there's some result that says that log n is optimal uh, if you want to represent your, all the cuts using one tree. OK, so this even for a grid. So in, in some sense, the bound there is optimal. The body on the right-hand side, or the log n. If you want to have one tree, you cannot go below, below log n. But what happens if you want really insist on a better approximation? You want better than log n, maybe constant approximation for all the cuts. We don't want to store the entire graph. It's too, too big. So there is this other result that now says we can do that, but not using a tree. Okay, if you give up on the tree, requirement, which is a strong structural requirement. If you remember the way I motivated the whole thing in the beginning was I want a small sketch. It doesn't have to be a tree structure. Tree was convenient. It's small. You have fast queries. But there's no reason to insist on a tree. I mean, no constraint to insist on a tree. So we can do better if you relax this. You don't re restrict yourself to a tree. In particular, let's look at, at uh, the following uh, uh, situation. So now we really, just like before, we have all the cuts. So Q is basically the queries that I said before is like all the subsets. And we have this theorem. So uh, this goes back to Bensur and Karger, who came up with this concept of a cut sparsifier and then later improvements, quantitative improvements, and others. Um, so basically, you say for every graph G, as you get this input, you can construct there exists a graph G prime. That has few edges, only linear in n, order n divided by epsilon squared. And in that new graph G prime, and it has the same set of vertices, 
And in, if you look at the every cut SS bar in G prime and in G, they approximately have the same capacity, up to one plus epsilon. Okay, so you can approximate simultaneously all the cuts within factor one plus epsilon, but now you don't have a tree. You have a sparse graph because it's only linear, linearly many edges. Okay, now how do you build this? I didn't want, this is like a talk by itself, it would be, and it's very interesting. But in one line, I'd say you take the graph G and you subsample the edges. So for every edge E, you have to sample it with some probability P or PE. P that depends on, the, on this E. If you decide to sample the edge, you give it capacity, you increase the capacity by one over P. So you're doing sampling, but then you increase the capacity inverse proportionally, so that keeps the expectation similar to what you had before. Okay, and the whole difficulty is to analyze the, uh, the concentration, to show that it's concentrated. The expectation is good, but you have two to the end many cuts. So it's difficult to analyze all the cuts. You cannot just do a, a straightforward union bound. That's the approach of not all, but, but uh, many of the algorithms. Okay, so if you use this, you get a sketch of size linear in N. You somehow represent the graph, actually using another graph, G prime, so it's very useful because you can run graph algorithms on this G prime if you want to. Um, so this time it's approximate, so it's not exactly as I said before, as we had before for Gomery Hu. And it is deterministic, you'll see in a minute why it's deterministic, like the contrast to deterministic uh, guarantee. And you can ask whether this trade-off is optimal. So in terms of n, it seems optimal, right? Uh, this should be easy, it's easy to prove that you need at least size n. But what about the epsilon squared? Can you drive it down? So we usually think of epsilon as being a constant, and therefore we kind of like say, oh, it's only order n. But once you get to this beautiful result with many applications, um, maybe it's important to get the dependence on epsilon down. There could be uh, cases where epsilon is actually smaller than a constant. For example, think of like epsilon being like one over root n. Okay, then one over root n, then the graph that you get is already n squared edges, which means that you, you know, G prime has n squared edges, which means that you're already like, you're, you're doing nothing. So if epsilon is really, really small, basically this result somehow would go like extrapolate to n cubed, and that, that does not make sense. Right, it's not useful, but it does not make sense. So maybe it's actually the right answer is n over epsilon. That would scale nicely. Right, that seems like a reasonable conjecture, but it's a wrong conjecture. So uh, really, we can prove a lower bound that says that you need n over epsilon squared. The dependence on epsilon has to be quadratic for such a guarantee. So this was uh, first shown in a paper that uh, I had with uh, Andoni, Chen, Shin, Woodruff, and Zhang. And there's like a simpler proof, very nice one, and also gets uh, like an extra log n factor uh, by uh, Carlson, Kola, Srivastava, and Trevisan. And it says the following, that if, we, uh, if you're trying to do this sketch of, a, of all the cuts, all two to the n cuts, any sketch, you don't, you're not necessarily trying to construct a graph G prime. You can represent it any way you want. For example, three graphs, and you take you know, this, something from this graph plus something from this graph minus the third graph. Any way you represent your, your, your uh, data, you really need at least n, of, n times log n divided by epsilon squared many bits if you're representing all the cut values with this approximation one plus epsilon. Okay, so there's a lower bound. Information theoretically, there's a lower bound. This is an information theoretic proof. There's a lower bound on how much information you need to store about the graph to be able to, to report all the cuts with some approximation. Okay, so here's like one immediate corollary of this. So if you wanted a sparsifier, a cut sparsifier, a graph, so now not just an arbitrary sketch, but a, a graph sparsifier G prime, then that graph has to have at least n over epsilon squared edges, which matches the construction I showed you in the previous slide. Okay, for graphs G prime, the optimal size is really n over epsilon squared. Why? Because if, if there was, if you could always do it if, if using less than n over epsilon squared edges, I could just encode these edges. Encoding an edge, you have to encode the two endpoints, that's log n bits for each one and the weight of the edge. And if you do a simple calculation, log n bits is enough again. So basically, the, the size of the encoding will only be like the number of edges here, times log n bits per edge. And if the number of edges is always small, then you contradict the theorem above. So you derive immediately a lower bound on, on combinatorial objects. 
Okay, so let me say it differently. The corollary is about the size of a combinatorial object, cut sparsifier, which is somewhat analogous say, to spanners, if you know that. The, the theorem above is about information theory. It says how many bits you need. Sort of like a distance oracle. You have some data structure that is so many bits. Okay, so of course one implies the other, it's very natural. But you get tight lower bound for, for the combinatorial object by using information theoretical arguments. Okay, so we cannot go shave off this epsilon squared to epsilon. Um, but actually we can do it if we relax the, re the requirements. Okay, so if we replace the requirement with a randomized, requirement, a randomized guarantee, or randomized uh, requirement, then actually we do that. We, we can improve. So what is the, the improved, uh, the, relaxed, the relaxed guarantee? Is that if you're trying to estimate a particular cut, SS bar, within one plus epsilon, you have high probability of success. So let's say high probability is three quarters. Fix it. High probability is three quarters. So for every specific cut, I'm going to have high probability of success. Of course, this, this three quarters is easy to improve by just you repeat, say, log n times, and take the median result. That would improve the, the probability of uh, push down the, the failure probability from 1 over 4 to 1 over poly n. If it's 1 over poly n, then you can take union bound over poly n many cuts. But if you have 2 to the n cuts, choices for s, you cannot take union bound over all of them. Okay, so up to logs, this is the, the, this is the same, like three quarters or something. But if you want to get all the cuts, then it's not good enough. Now, this guarantee, this randomized guarantee is called, uh, we call it for each guarantee. This comes, comes from, the name, this name comes from compressed sensing, where they have this uh, for all and for each, which I think usually in English is the same, but, but in compressed sensing, it's, they're different. So we're using that terminology. It's like a for each guarantee. Uh, and then what we could show in that same paper is that actually for the for each guarantee, we can build a sketch which has size O tilde of n over epsilon. So now we compared, we do have some log factors, so perhaps it, ca it can be improved, but the dependence on epsilon, that was our emphasis, is actually linear and not quadratic. Okay, so it bypasses the lower bound by basically relaxing the, the requirement. And this sketch is actually doesn't, this is a sketch. It's not really a, a graph. So this sketch is, doesn't give you just one graph G prime. If you look into it, what it does is basically something like this. You get a, a subgraph G prime and a list of all the vertex degrees. And then you do some calculation between the two to estimate the, the, the value of a cut. In a, like a one line, why is it important? Well, the way you construct G prime, I told you before in the cut sparsifier is by sampling. So you sample these edges. So let's look at the cut where you have one vertex and, and a few edges, and you sample these edges, subsample the edges. Then you're gonna have some variance. And this variance is gonna be relatively large, and that's what usually gives this epsilon squared. When you have this epsilon, to get epsilon error, that's like kind of like standard from various calculations. To get epsilon error, you need one over epsilon squared many samples. And that basically means that you need to, s the degree of that vertex is going to be one over epsilon squared, and that's true for every vertex. And overall, you get n over epsilon squared many edges. So how can we ro work around this? Well, the degrees we store exactly. So therefore, we don't have this error here. And what happens in other cuts? If it's not just like the degree of a vertex, it's not like I cut one vertex and all the, the other ones. Turns out that here you can actually do better because, for example, if the cut is like n over two vertices and n over two vertices, there are like going to be many, many, many edges here. And then when you subsample, actually it's going to be highly concentrated. So the, really the problem with concentrations is only with values that are small. So, uh, I mean, this is like a very, very high level argument. It's not the way the proof works. But, but really the problem is really that the singletons, one vertex and all the outgoing edges, these are the most difficult ones. And for this we need, uh, a different argument, or, or using the exact degrees. Okay, now I told you that it, it, uh, you can amplify the probability, and it, you can actually extend it also to spectral queries, but I'm not going to go into that. It's another extension of cuts that was true also in the previous slides that I don't want to get into. So I want to keep everything, uh, the discussion here, all about cuts. 
Uh, here is like an example application. Yeah, suppose you have two graphs. This is like a distributed instance. Suppose you have two graphs, one into two different machines, G1 and G2, and you want to sketch them and then compute the minimum cut for the union. So the two graphs are on the same vertex set. Basically, you're doing the union of the edge set. And you want to compute the minimum cut. Okay, so if you use the cut specifier from before, you can do that. You, can, you estimate all the cuts in G1, you send that. You estimate all the cuts in G2 using a sketch or cut specifier. You send, you send it to a center or something. And the center will take the union of these two, and all the cuts are now approximate within 1 plus epsilon multiplicatively. And therefore, in particular, the minimum cut would be approximated within 1 plus epsilon. So you can optimize on these union of the two sparsifiers. And that would give you dependence of 1 over epsilon squared, because you want to use these cut sparsifiers that have uh, uh, dependence on, uh, quadratic dependence on epsilon. What we could do using the sketches is actually get it down to 1 over epsilon. And the idea is like this. You do the same thing we did before for G1 and G2, but for a constant epsilon, one point, I said, con epsilon equals 0.1. So you get this 1.1 cut sparsifier. So that only gives you a constant approximation for the cut. Now what happens is that there is a theorem by uh, Karger mentioned here from Karger 2000 that says that the number of approximate mean cuts up to, say, factor 2 is only polynomial in n. So from this approximate object, we can come up with n to the 4, n to the 4 candidates for the cuts. And we only need to get a high accuracy bound on these candidates. Okay, and for this, we use the sketch that I showed you before. If we amplify the success probability to be strong enough to withstand polynomially many queries, then we run these queries on these n to the four candidates. Okay, so basically, I, mean, I don't want to go into the details. It's not complicated, but you're using a, a constant like 0.1, oh, 0 0.1, epsilon equals 0 0.1 in the usual cut sparsifier. And then a high accuracy sketch, just like I showed you before, which is, uh, requires smaller space. OK. So this was about, uh, so far we discussed approximating all cuts. Now I'm going to change a little bit to a uh, slightly different topic when I have only a subset of the cuts that I care about, and you'll see in a minute. And then I'm going to have like a, another set of, kind of like results and questions that involve these different concepts. Okay, so if you're uh, lost in the previous slide, now you can come back. And on this slide, it's like a new, slightly different setup. Suppose we have this graph, same as before, but now we have k important vertices, and we're going to call them terminals. Okay, these are important for us. Maybe the graph is huge, like the entire internet, but we, I don't know, uh, only, only own or have access to 100 of them. And we want to understand the connectivity between these 100, but of course, the routing between them is not using our... Um, uh, edges, but they go through the internet, right? So there's some connectivity between them that goes through the other, uh, uh, other vertices. You can think of it as like a road network where you have like, I don't know, gas stations you want to go from one to the other, but I don't want to think about distances, so maybe gas stations is not the right example. Okay, but... Uh, okay, so we have these terminals. There are only K of them, so I'm going to use small k for the number of terminals, and capital K for the set of terminals. So it's almost the same. So in the picture before, this white, this black, black vertices, these are the terminals. And now let's look at the only cuts that involve the terminals. So what does it mean cuts that involve the terminals? I want to take the set of terminals, partition it into two in an arbitrary way. So you're going to have S and S bar. So S bar means just all the other terminals. I want to find the minimum cut between them. So what does it mean to find a minimum cut between them? So you know S is going to be on one side, S bar on the other side, and now you have to find a cut, minimum cut that separates them. But minimum cut in G, it means that you have to decide what to do with the other vertices. It's an optimization problem. Okay, so in this picture, you have the, the yellow ones are fixed to be S, the red ones are fixed to be S bar. You want to find a minimum cut, basically you have to decide what to do with all the remaining other green vertices, where to put them. Okay, so it's an optimization problem. Actually, it's not a difficult one. You can think of all, making all of S a super source, all of S bar a super sink, and then it's like the standard minimum ST cut, right? Single commodity flow. We've seen that. Typical exercise uh, in undergrad. 
So I want to call these terminal cuts, because we have the terminals. We want to somehow partition the terminals in a particular way. But of course, we have to cut the entire graph. Yeah. Yeah, so here, I'm coming to this. OK? So if you know S, like you're given S, basically, I'm going to call it like, like here min cut. OK? So given I'm not going to write down S bar explicitly. That's, that's the, in this notation. It's between S and S bar. You want to find the minimum cut, but it's an optimization problem because you have to optimize what to do with all the other vertices. OK? Um, and now, the way I'm going to think about it is like this. That's going to answer your question. So have the, term, the set of terminals is known in advance. It's fixed. But I'm going to have like queries. I want to optimize. I want to optimize for this S versus an S complement, or maybe another S and S complement, like left and right, or top and bottom, and whatever configuration. So I'm thinking of it as like I have many choices for S. How many choices for S do I have? About 2 to the K, the number of terminals, all subsets of the terminals. OK, so it's an optimization problem. Now, it turns out, you know, I was, when I was thinking about it, I found out that there's actually people have thought about it before. And they call this concept uh, a mimicking network. So what is this concept? I have this graph, huge graph G with only K terminals. I don't care about all the other vertices. I only care about the terminals. Like how much traffic can I ship from this subset to this subset of the terminals? So what they uh, came up with, they, they call it mimicking network. So it says that if you only care about cuts between the terminals, then, I, then I, maybe I have a smaller graph G prime with the same properties, exactly the same mean cuts. So you want to replace G with G prime, such that all the minimum cuts, for, like for all S, the minimum cuts are the same. So that answers your question, right? The terminals are fixed, but I have this guarantee for all subsets of the terminals. So like this, for all there is like over 2 to the K many requirements. OK, so it's equality, it's exact. So here is like a very simple illustration. It's like a very, very simple example, because it's a tree and, and very simple one. So suppose I have the graph G on the left. And the black vertices are the terminals, A, B, and C. OK, and have edge weights. And I want to like, simplify. I want to get rid of the, as many vertices as possible. I only care about cuts that involve A, B, and C. So for example, if I have these vertices here, these edges 2 and 5, nobody's going to bother cutting these edges, removing these edges, if you want to separate between A, B, and C. All right? So I don't really need these two vertices here. Similarly, if I have this, look at this A and B. So there's an edge of cost 3 and an edge of cost 9. Maybe you don't want to separate between A and B. That's fine. But if you want to separate between A and B, it's enough to cut one edge. It's enough to cut the edge of cost 3. You're never going to cut the edge of cost 9. So basically, in the G prime here, I don't have these 2 and 5 edges from before. And between A and B, I actually connect with one edge of cost 3. OK? And there you go, I mean, similarly. OK, it's a very, very simple example. But of course, you can, there are like some things that you don't need. Like if you have a path, all the vertices of like in this 3 and 9, it was basically a path. You don't need the entire path. It's enough to have one edge instead of the path. That's the general principle here. But I wanted to do it in general. And these people who came up with this concept, Hagerup, Katayanen, I think, Nishimura, and Ragde, so I hope I pronounced their names correctly, uh, they came up with a concept and they proved that if you have a K-terminal network, you can replace it always with a network. OK, I don't want to say smaller, but hopefully it's smaller. Its size is only 2 to the, two to the K. OK, so uh, this, on the one hand, uh, uh, you see in the second bullet, it's independent of N. So you can get rid of the dependence on, of N. On the other hand, it's pretty wasteful, right? 2 to the, two to the K, I wouldn't advise anybody to try it at home. So in particular, it's, it's more wasteful than just like listing all the cut values that we care about. These are 2 to the k cut values. Right? So if you just want to store it somehow, yeah, just store a list. If you insist that it's going to be a graph, you want to store it not just as a list. You want a graph that has the same properties, then basically this is the bound that we know up to date. The best one that we know up to date is 2 to the 2 to the k. It's exponentially more expensive than the information that you really need. OK? And that's open. That's going to be the next slide. That's still open between exponential and doubly exponential. It seems like baffling that it's still open, but uh, OK. So this is, uh, gives you like a sketch, because you can store, like the graph gives you a sketch, and it's exact. Uh, originally, it was proved for directed networks, but I'm going to focus on undirected networks. And what is the argument for this 2 to the 2 to the k? It's actually quite simple. So I summarize here it in, in, in two lines. 
So you take this, you look at all these two to the K cuts that you care about. What do these cuts really do? So basically every cut partitions the vertices into two sides. Let's call them left and right. So basically it gives like a labeling of the vertices by left and right, by one bit. Left and right or zero, one, something like this. And I have two to the K of this. So basically every vertex I can associate to every vertex like a vector of two to the K bits. Right, left or right, left or right, left or right, two to the K bits. And now, so it basically buckets all the vertices into two to the K, into some number of buckets. What is the number of buckets? Two to the two to the K, right? All the vertices with the exact same like signature, same label, right? The label is two to the K bits, so the number of signatures is two to the two to the K. And the argument is that if I merge vertices with the same label, the same signature, I, nothing happened because they always go to the same side of the cut. So if you merge them, what would be the reason not to merge them? Because if there's a cut where one vertex wants to go to left and the other vertex wants to go right, and by merging them, you do not allow it. If they're going to the same side anyway, you might consider them as one vertex. That's the whole argument. Okay, so just merge all those with the same signature, you get two to two, two K vertices. And the, all the cuts are, that you care about do not, did not change. Okay. <clears throat> So here are the questions. I told you this gap between doubly exponential and singly exponential is still open. Um, there's the only no lower bound that we know is, is uh, exponential, 2 to the omega k. This was a work I did with a student of mine, Havana Rika, back at the time, and independently was done by, uh, was proved by uh, Kanan Raghavendra. That's one question. Another question related, open question related to these things is, can you do something better for special graph families? What would be like a special graph family? Of course, planar things seems very reasonable. So uh, for planar, actually, in that paper with, uh, with my student, we improved it to something very close to exponential in K. So very close to 2 to the 2K. So it's exponential in K, single exp exponential. And uh, a bit later, there was a lower bound, uh, a couple of years later, that, that showed that it's tight for planar graphs. Because the, the first lower bound I showed you above was not planar. Uh, so now for planar, we basically know the answer. Okay, yeah, and there are like other cases. What happens if it's planar and say then all the vertices, all the terminals only touch one face or only a few faces? Then you can do even better. What we don't know how to do is completely we don't know is how to do excluded minor. Graphs that, that exclude a fixed minor. So, you know, generally if you have something for planar, you say, okay, the next step would be excluded minor. You'd believe it's true, but the techniques that we use are com completely incompatible with excluded minor. They really use the drawing in the plane. So I don't know how to, how to ex uh, extend them. So it means that we need new techniques here. Uh, another thing we don't know, what happens if you look at the multi-commodity flows? So I told you it's like a strong requirement. It's a, uh, something I don't want to go into the details, but this is completely open. We have absolutely no idea what to do there. Okay, so moving forward to another question, is this was, okay, it was in the previous slide, but it was all exact. All the values, the cut values, were exactly equal. That's a strong requirement. That's why we got this exponential, or even doubly exponential, God forbid, um, size. Can we push it down by allowing constant factor approximation, or maybe one plus epsilon even? Okay, then maybe you can get around this bottleneck of ex exponential in K. That's a reasonable wishful thinking approach, right? So. Allow approximation here. So uh, by large, I'll, I can say this is still open. Okay, we don't know how to do that. We'd like to do that. We have very, very partial answers, like for a few intermediate questions. Uh, okay, so let me uh, sketch what we I showed you before about these planar graphs uh, here. This um, no, so here. This two to the k upper bound. I'm, I'm not going to show you all the slides, even though it was a sketch, like a high uh, sketch of the argument. I'll skip it. Uh, I'll do it even faster so, um, to finish in time. So basically, the argument is that right, we, for planar graphs, we can do something better than this bucketing this that I showed you before. But two to the two to the k. Uh, this is the theorem. What is the algorithm? It's almost like the same algorithm. Okay, you look at all the cuts that you care about. Think of, think of like removing them from the graph, 
So you also only see things that always went, wanted to be on the same side of the cut. So if I have this mental picture, I have the graph, think of like trying to separate every set that wants to be together in the cut, and I have like multiple such sets, I draw all of them together, and then I look at these areas that in between, like this area here, right, in between, all these vertices want to be together anyway. I can just merge them. So in graph language, it's like contracting these edges, it's a connected component, I contract it in one vertex. Okay, that's gonna be the argument. It's essentially the same argument as before, same algorithm. But now we're gonna analyze it for planar graphs. So here is the, the idea. What are these circles that I do? So if you have a, 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 a subset S of vertices that you care about, E sub S is like the subset of edges, these are like the cut, the edges that you wanna cut if you wanna separate S from S bar. This is like the optimal cut. So you fix such cut, maybe there are ties, if there are ties you break the tie or something, you fix such cut. Uh, for every S. And then I want to draw it. Now if I want to draw it, if the graph is drawn in the plane, then it's well known that the dual of a cut is actually a cycle. In this case, it's not necessarily one cycle, it's a union of cycles because uh, of some technical reasons here. So it's planar, if you use planar duality, you can really draw it as a cycle, or a union of cycles. So I'm just gonna go over all these sets S, two to the K sets S. For each of them, I'm gonna draw the cycle. It's actually not gonna be one cycle, it's gonna be up to K cycles. I'm gonna draw all of them. And that's the picture that you see. And it basically partitions the vertices. And the question is, how many areas do you see in the picture? Can you bound the number of areas that you see in the picture, right? Areas, contiguous regions that you see in the picture. That's the question. If you can bound this, then you're done. Okay, so here we have two lemmas, and let's uh, say basically the, the lemma number two, if you look at this union of all these cycles, the plane is partitioned only into something like two to the k about two to the K regions. That's the, the main lemma. And the, the high level argument is like this. You look at this picture, now each of these is like a cycle, right? Like in, I drew one of them. So you have in the cycle vertices of, of degree two. These are not interesting. They do not really tell us information about the, the number of regions. And I can bound the number of regions by looking at all the vertices of degree three and above, like strictly more than two, and summing the degrees. Basically, every time uh, you have like a vertex of degree, like here, four, you have four regions around it. Right? So if I sum up all the degrees, I upper bound the number of regions. So I want to bound this sum of degrees, but only for high degree vertices, or more than two. And this you can do because you say every such intersection here, how did I get this? It was some cycle coming from S and from, coming from some T, or S prime. Okay, so I have to say, how many pairs do I have? Only two to the K, choose two, right? Pairs. So you do this charging argument, you have to do, make sure that you don't charge somebody over and over again too many times, but that's how you bound these things. Okay, the overcharging is this OK that you get here, or something. Okay, so that's the argument, uh, and that shows you something about the planar network, how do you construct things for planar networks. Basically, the algorithm is still very simple, that's my, say, concern. Um, okay, so now what if you allow bigger approximation? Just like before, we had exact, um, maybe order one, we don't know what to do, and maybe uh, logarithmic. So if you, uh, if you uh, allow a logarithmic approximation, then actually you can come up with a graph, always come up with a graph G prime, uh, that is a graph only on the terminals. You don't need any extra vertices. Okay, but now this is going to the other extreme. The graph is very, very small, the object, the sketch, but the approximation is, okay, I don't know if to call it large, I don't wanna say terrible, but it's much larger than before. Okay, and in this case, actually below log, it's log over log log. Okay, that's always possible, and if the graph is planar, then it actually get better, we call this usually the quality, this approximation factor, or accuracy, and in planar graphs, we can get to order one, but in general graphs, uh, it's logarithmic in K. Not in N, in K, the number of terminals. Um, and we don't know if it's optimal, the current lower bound is like written here, square root log k. So there's a gap there, but it seems like constant you cannot do. Constant you can factor approximation, you cannot achieve. But maybe if you allow a sketch, maybe you can do better. Arbitrary sketch, not necessarily this kind of guarantee. For example, instead of having a graph only on the terminals, which has k vertices and maybe k squared edges, maybe you can have a graph with two k vertices. 
Okay, cubed vertices. That's still relatively small. We don't know what happens in that regime. Um, what we, we were hoping that with, say, k cubed vertices, you can get order one approximation. Okay, this is open. I don't know how to prove that. I think it's very, very interesting to prove such a thing. Uh, what we are able to show is like one example, if the graph is bipartite, they can actually achieve high quality, one plus epsilon, and the size of the graph is only polynomial in K. We didn't really try to op optimize it, maybe it was K to the five or, or something like this. Um, yeah, so jumping here to the open problems, it would be interesting to show, to show more examples where you can get high quality. This is only for bipartite graphs, right, this result. It's like very, very good, but only holds for bipartite graphs. Uh, we don't know how to deal with planar graphs. We don't know about lower bounds. This is what I mentioned before. So I have some slides about the first theorem, how, what do you do in, in bipartite graphs. I'll tell you just the algorithm without the analysis because I'm running out of time. Um, okay, so here's the, the high level argument about the algorithm. It's very different from the algorithm I've shown you before. That's why I want to show you the algorithm. So suppose this is the graph. So you have the two terminals on the side, only two terminals, and only, only the other vertices in the middle. The algorithm that we used before was basically edge sampling. You sample every edge independently. This would be very bad if you think of it like as a flow argument. You're trying to maintain the flow from the left to the right. If you sample independently, you're not going to have paths. So that's going to perform very poorly if you're doing independent sampling. Instead, what you want to do, you want to sample paths. Right? Once you sample the left edge, I want to sample also the right edge to maintain the paths, this correlation. And because it's bipartite, then we can do something. Okay, so basically sampling paths, instead of sampling pairs of edges, instead I'm going to sample the, vertex, the vertices in the middle, independently. But if I sample the vertex in the middle, in the middle layer here, I actually sample all the edges incident to it. So basically it, it translates to sampling non-terminals, and whenever I sample the non-terminals, I keep all the edges around it, but I, of course, uh, increase their capacity, inverse proportional to the sampling rate. So we want the expectation to always be like one. So if I sample with probably 1%, if that vertex is sampled, all the incident edges are amplified, their capacity is amplified by factor 100. Okay, so in expectation, it's, everything's preserved, and it's all about analyzing the concentration. Okay, so I'm gonna skip this argument. Uh, you, the, the whole point is to decide on these probabilities P sub V, how to sample. This is the whole thing, and you have to analyze it, and we're using uh, important sampling. So uh, basically, you have to decide about the probability by seeing how important is it. If it's a vertex that has, it's like the, the only vertex connects some terminal one to terminal two, then you have to keep it, because if you do not sample it, the, 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 like the flow between these vertices or cut becomes zero, right? So uh, basically, that's the important sampling argument. Um, one last thing is that it has a con surprising connection to hypergraphs. Okay, so there was a recently there was like a, okay, not recently, there was like some result, I, I tried to extend these known results about graphs to hypergraphs, mentioned here, and we can get, we can have the same definition, the capacity is preserved, this is edge specification. You have a hypergraph, so I'm going to make a connection between the two parts of the talk now. So I'm going back to this edge specification. You have a lot of edges, you want to sparsify them. So you can sample down the edges, and maintain all the cuts within one plus epsilon. Okay, you have to say what is the definition of a capacity of a, high, of a cut in a hypergraph. All right, because now an edge touches many, many vertices. So the definition is like this. You pay the capacity of the edge if the edge touches, intersects both S and S bar. But you pay one. It doesn't matter where the edge touches, say one vertex from here and, I don't know, 100 from the other side, or it's about 50-50, okay, per unit, like the capacity of the edge. So what we're able to prove is something like n squared many edges in a hypergraph. And it's open whether you can, that's I think a fascinating open problem, where you can improve it to order n. Because the only lower bound that we have is basically order n from graphs, and we don't know whether hypergraphs are different from graphs in this sense. Now this proof basically works, okay, there are some, several proofs by now, one of them at least works by just like using what you know for graphs and just extending, like using, repeating the same steps, you have to verify every step works, sort of. Um, but it has connection to vertex parsifiers because you can represent a hyper, a hyper graph by a bipartite graph. I'm sure all of you have seen that. You put the vertices on one side, like V of H on the one side, 
the hyper edges on the other side, and you put an edge if they're connected. And now it looks like a bipartite graph that you, and these are like, I'm gonna call these terminals. I wanna partition the terminal into two sets. I wanna make sure that something happens correctly. If you look at it, this something is very, very similar to what I had in the previous slide about these terminal cuts. Not exactly, there's a difference, but, but the difference is small, and the proof that I had before actually works also here. With it can be easily modified. Okay, so that means that you have like yet another proof for this um, hypergraph by using what we had in the previous slide with this important sampling argument. Okay, just works immediately with, with adapt, just adjusting the, the quantities. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here. Basically what I uh, wanted to tell you is that there are very interesting combinatorial features you wanna estimate using a sketch. And uh, there are many different questions here about, for example, the size of the, the sketch compared to the approximation. Of course, better, better approximation would require probably a bigger object, bigger sketch. We want to understand this. Uh, another question I really don't understand is that the difference between graphs and non-graphs. So you have a sketch which is basically like a graph G prime or something else like a table of all the cuts or a graph plus a list of degrees. Right? This is a non-graph anymore. So somehow, when are graphs like more restricted and where is like uh, the general, more general object of the data structure helps you. And finally, I talked about cuts here. Sometimes, and many times, there are connections between cuts and distances. Okay, here I didn't touch upon this, but they do not seem relevant to all these results, but only to related results in a sense. So it's like, it feels like we need to find out yet another connection here that we don't know yet. Thanks. So one of the things uh, you mentioned in the end is a degree sequence alone. Yeah. So degree sequence alone would probably be a sketch because it gives you part of the information about the graph without yep. telling you the whole graph. So there could be things like uh, determining whether the graph is connected or disconnected, sometimes connected, sometimes disconnected, always connected, always disconnected. And other things based on just a degree sequence. So that well, well, probably that's not going to tell you whether it's connected because if all degree sequence is two every time, all, all the time, to be one Hamiltonian cycle. So the degree sequence can give you the information that it is always connected, never connected, or like the example you gave is sometimes connected, sometimes disconnected. Yes, right. So I, I was. Uh, oh, I see. So I'm saying, uh, so and uh, other things based on degree sequence, I was looking at uh, recently, uh, some sense. So uh, okay. that qualifies as graph sketching. Yeah, yeah, I think definitely. I think I was looking at it from the other angle of like, I know what are the questions, I'm trying to figure out what is the sketch. You're asking somewhat like in the opposite direction. Yes, of the same, the same, the same question. Like, degree sequence. If, if I give you this information, what can you deduce? Right? Yes. Given information, what, what, yeah. Like you, uniquely or not uniquely, etc. Yes, yes. Yeah, I have not thought about it, but uh, of course. Are there works on, uh, if you update the graph, how the sketch would be updated? Uh, yeah, very good question. Uh, I think in the, like a long time ago or whatever, there, were, there was no work on this, but recently people have looked at the dynamic algorithms, uh, trying to update this, and there are some recent work on this. So of course they do not improve the best bounds, they're actually doing suboptimal in terms of like the size, maybe like extra log or something. But they're trying to bound the update time from reconstructing everything so there are like two or three papers, I think, about it um, recently, like the last two years. Basically, you don't want to reconstruct everything. Uh, Sorry? Basically, you don't want to reconstruct everything. Yeah. 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 Also, like in my talk, I focus more on the existential results, like, and some of them are non-constructive or will take exponential time. So definitely, that's bad, right? Like even reconstructive will take exponential time. But, but most of them, uh, so I mentioned the one case where it's not obvious how to extend it. All the other things are actually algorithmic uh, immediately. So do you think the graphical representation might have an advantage for such a situation where, because if you're yeah. extracting the information and making it abstract? Yeah, that could be, yeah, so that could be a scenario. I mean, I don't know of such a thing, but it could be that if you insist on a graph, it's difficult to update. Well, if you allow arbitrary data structure, so you relax the constraint, then maybe now the updates are easy to, to implement because you, you're not restricted by this graphical structure. So that could be a way where, where this extra freedom actually buys you, I say, being uh, dynamic. Uh, like in this case, uh, storing the degree sequences helped in saving, uh, instead of one by epsilon square, you got a one by epsilon. 
do you expect uh, this idea to work in other settings or have you tried it uh, elsewhere where uh, uh, because this one by epsilon square kind of comes up almost everywhere uh, where sampling is happening yeah um, <laughs> but I, no it kind of like it took me by surprise as well that it worked uh, so we look at a few other examples. It, it, you have to find a place where there is a way, like even here you have to relax the, the, the requirements. Yeah, you have to find a place where, say you have a bound of one over epsilon squared, and you suspect it's not optimal, right? So, uh, which was the case back then, in that case. In many cases it was like so obvious that one over epsilon squared is actually optimal for that particular setting. So it's a little bit difficult to find such a potential uh, yeah, question. So, uh, in your case, you're trying to uh, actually uh, use limited information, representation, from the point of view of reducing the data space. Probably. Yeah. I'm not sure uh, how it is directly related, but there is a, uh, there's an old thing I saw a long time ago on actually using more space. <laughs> so, it's counterintuitive, but nevertheless, yeah. uh, so there's this thing called some graph reconstruction conjecture, where you uh, repeatedly drop uh, all the n vertices of the graph in turn, uh, drop with replacement. So you get your n uh, subgraphs with one vertex each dropped, mm -hmm. and without the labels, of course. Uh, can you reconstruct as a conjecture? So that yeah. is a, that is more like a cryptography. I mean, sometimes you're hiding the information thing, whether you can get it. Right. So it just uh, occurred to me it's interesting because there you have an expansion of the data set. Right. So sometimes you do that, especially for uh, to get I mean to get speed. For example, if you have like a pre-processing, you have a bigger object, but then you can answer queries faster. Which I didn't talk about speed here because I want to make the story simple. Of course, it's important. I treated it as a second class object. In those cases, are really interesting. I find it interesting. I think it touches upon this uh, pink thing about combinatorial and information theory. But it's not in the focus of the talk. But I find it uh, very interesting as well. Thank you. Thank you.